Now, not everyone agrees it's possible or even desirable to try to heal those divisions. And yet, in a 50-50 Senate and a bitterly divided country, bipartisanship is necessary for the nation to move forward. In the past several weeks, we have featured bipartisan conversations on the show. And this morning, we're going to take on the very idea of unity in a very special conversation, an exclusive interview with two of the most powerful senators in Washington, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who is here for her first Sunday show in more than five years and has bucked the majority in her party on issues from health care to the Supreme Court, along with Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who has been one of the deciding votes on much of the Biden agenda. They're both here today for a substantive conversation on bipartisanship and whether that idea, which is both revered and reviled in politics, bipartisanship, is still possible in today's Washington. Senators Murkowski and Manchin, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate Great it. Great being with you, Jake. Great to be back. It's <laughs> five years. Five I didn't years. realize. Okay. So, Senator Murkowski, we have a lot to talk about. But uh, let's start with uh, the, the major bipartisan achievement, perhaps, of the last even decade. And that is the infrastructure bill, the infrastructure law. How did that plan succeed where so many, <clears throat> pardon me, where so many other previous attempts at bipartisanship have failed? And, and how is that a, a blueprint possibly for moving forward? It really came about because you had a small group of people that said, we need to get something done rather than just send a message from our respective parties. You know, we do that a lot around here, but, but a commitment to a solution, a commitment to getting to yes. And I think that's what, that's what we had with that small working group. It was four and four, mm -hmm. um, expanded a little bit. But there was a good faith effort to work through the hard things. And I think sometimes when, when the going gets tough, we just say, that's too hard. And we retreat to the party messages. But I think there was a recognition that the country needed something. The country needed a step towards healing. As the president just said in that lead in, you know, how do we get to unity? Well, part of the problem that we have, we're not, we're not gonna agree on things. We're, we're a big country. So there's plenty of room for disagreement, but we've got to get to the place where we understand one another. And you can't get to understanding without listening. And I think what happened with that bipartisan group was we were listening to one another. You know, you think about infrastructure needs for the country. I come from a state, we don't have mass transit. I looked at, at the proposal and was like, we don't need to spend that much money on mass transit. But then I had to explain to them why, instead of surface transportation, I needed, I needed support in Alaska for things like a marine highway system when you have 80% of your communities that aren't connected by road. Mm -hmm. And so I had to listen to people like Mark Warner. And Mark Warner had to listen to people like me explain what goes on in my part of the country. And we listened to one another, gained an understanding, and said, this, the country needs this. The country needs to know that we can get something done for the good of everybody, not for the good of our respective parties, but for the good of the country. And, and so and, that's what we did. And you're working right now, both of you, yeah. on uh, election reform. Yeah. Uh, the previous uh, efforts uh, <clears throat> didn't get, well, you didn't support changing the rules, the, the filibuster right. rules, although you supported the two election reform bills. Uh, and right now, the Electoral Count Act of 1887, there's ambiguity in it. I mean, everybody, there's consensus as to generally what it means, but it's written in such a way. What sticking points are left? Where is that no, going? We're, as, as Lisa had said, first of all, you have people that got together who understand each other, but know each other and like each other. Democrats and Republicans, that's how we came together on the other one. And if you recall, leadership broke down for five months and we had unemployment was going to expire. We had businesses were still hurting. We weren't sure about the COVID vaccine. All that was still in doubt when we did the December bill, the bipartisan 908 bill. Mm -hmm. We did that because we said something has to be done. So all we did was take the practical approach with friends who could talk to each other and look exactly what the country needed, our states and our country, but the country first. And we did that and worked at it, and we broke down our groups, took our, what we had interest in, what we had some expertise in, and brought it all together. And then they took it from there, put it up, and we voted for it. And, uh, but, Jake, on what you're talking about right yeah. now, what, what really caused the, the insurrection? They thought there was a kind of ambiguity, ambiguity if you will, and there was an a, a, a avenue they could go through and maybe overturn the election. Because there was. It was not clear. And when one congressman and one senator can bring a state's uh, authentic count uh, to a halt, 
It's wrong. And basically not protecting the electors, and you can change electors before you send them here, after the election, all these things. This is what we're going to fix. And we have a group right now that's continuing to grow. Yeah, We're 16. over probably 15 to 20 people that mm -hmm. want to be part of it now. So do you think it's going to pass? Oh, I think absolutely it'll pass. Now, yeah. there'll be some people saying it's not enough. There'll be other people saying that it's more than what we should do or we don't need it. And what we'll do is try to bring them all together and say, listen, this is what we should do because this is what caused the problem and it's what we can do. So and, let's do that. And Senator McCowan. Kind of, if I can just yeah. interject here, because to Joe's point, some are going to criticize it for not being enough. Others will say too much. So yeah. we, I kind of have said we're going to take the Goldilocks approach here. What's we're going to try right? to find what's just right. That's exactly. And it's not going to be just right for everybody, but will it, be, will it be a step ahead? Will it be important for the country? Yeah. It'll solve the problem right. that caused the problem. Right. So uh, Vice President Pence on Friday, former Vice President Pence, um, addressed this, talking about how he didn't have uh, the ability to, to change the election despite some bad faith reading uh, of the Electoral Count Act. Uh, take a listen. President Trump is wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. Frankly, there is no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. So I know you agree with that, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you're looking to clear up and make sure no, right. there's no discrepancies. Is there anything else that you're willing to do uh, in terms of preserving the right to vote uh, in this country along along with clearing up the Electoral Count Act. Well, and this is where this group, and as Joe says, a growing group, is, is looking to explore. I think we've identified clearly some things within the uh, ECA, the Electoral Count Act, that need to be addressed, the ambiguities that need to be addressed. But is there more that we can do? And I think this is where we're seeking to find that common ground. I know, for one, we want to make sure that if you are if you're going to be an election worker, if you're going to be there at the polling booth, you don't feel intimidated or threatened or harassed. You know, protections for that. What, what are we doing to ensure that states have the ability to provide security for their elections? So we're looking at application of the HAVA Act, which is the Help Americans Vote Act, which has been in place for a long while now, working with the uh, Electoral uh, Commission uh, act to, to determine, all right, what more can we do in terms of safeguards, safeguards to voting, ensuring that there is an appropriate chain of custody once ballots are cast. So we're, we are sitting down, I think, again, as members in good faith to ensure that election integrity across all 50 states Mm -hmm. moves yes. forward in a positive way. What we've seen, basically, the courts have overturned some of the uh, redistricting, and that means the Voters' Rights Act of 1965. There are still parts that are still very protective and good. What we're looking at is now how do we protect what happened in insurrection that'll never happen again, such as that people think they can come here and overturn it. But on the other hand, how do we protect voters, I mean election uh, workers, uh, with uh, federal crimes if someone uh, threatens them or intimidates them or interferes with the election. What about attempts in some states to make it tougher to vote, which is clearly going well, on? Well, here's what I've tried to do, and we're trying to, we want to keep this alive and talk. For every American has absolutely the right to vote, and it should be protected by law, but it's not written. This is what we're looking at that, if we can do that without infringing, but basically that's pretty, pretty common sense. The thing that, that we've been talking about, and I came up with a, just a, threw an idea out, and, and this is how we kind of discuss things, and I said, since we don't want anybody telling Alaska what your election law should be or anyone telling West Virginia, the 10th Amendment, the Constitution, states' rights, that these should not be federal elections. But don't you think the last election we might have had that wasn't in conflict would be 2018? So if we said, okay, that'll be the baseline for every state, whatever your election laws were in 2018, that'll be your base. Is that something you could go you along can't with? can't regret. This, is, this goes back to what I had said earlier. Let's listen to one another. Yeah. Let's listen to one. I have shared some things about issues related to chain of custody when you're in a state like Alaska, where, again, how you move those, those ballots right. from a tiny little village that may be shut down by weather, the only way to move them is by small airplane, and there's no small airplanes that are coming in for four days. What do you do? That's a, that's a different thing they where they can get that. the car in West Virginia. Until she tells us that, we couldn't even figure out what she's talking about. And so let's about. listen to one another. Let's listen to what, what we yeah. might be able to come up with. You might notice that Joe and I were 
were two that were working on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to right. see if we couldn't get. But you were the only Republican that was willing to listen to. And it. you know what? We've got to be able to count around here too. We've got to be able to count to ensure that we can do more than just come together in good faith and goodwill and get some good ideas on paper and say we like this. But if we don't have the votes to make it happen, yeah. it doesn't we happen. Need to get to sixty. And so what, how we're going to do that is Jake, what happens. Working. People are afraid to even discuss anymore. You know. Yeah. Uh, your guilt by association before now your guilt by conversation. We're not wor worried about that. We're still talking. We're still trying to throw ideas off of each other. We have a lot of Republicans uh, that like some of the things we're talking about. They might have some concerns they bring up. We have to uh, understand their concerns. They have to respond to their constituency. But we respect each other. There's a difference, but you have to work at this. This is not easy because basically everything's pulling you apart. We're fighting against everybody pulling us apart to bring us back together. Before, but I, I do want to ask you one non-bipartisan related uh, uh, question before we take a break, sure. which is Build Back Better uh, is it dead? Is there any opportunity for it to come back uh, with well, the, your support? The bill back better as, as it has been presented uh, over, what, the last seven, eight, nine months? Mm -hmm. That bill no longer will exist, okay? Should there be parts of it? Do you want to talk about different things? I think the president said there might be certain parts and this and that. My biggest concern and my biggest opposition, it did not go through the process. Whether Lisa votes for it or not being a Republican, she should have at least the opportunity to have input. It should have gone through the committee. These are major changes. It's going to change society as we know it. Yeah, and so those guys, changes should be a hearing. It I, should be a markup. And then you're going to have a better product whether, they, whether your friends on the other side vote for it or not. But they have to have input. Have you talked we to President Biden about that? We could work on energy and climate well, if we went through the committee. Yeah. Right. You're well, on the committee together. In fact, yeah. I want to talk about well, that in one will. second. Let me, let me stick around. Uh, <laughs> we have much more to talk about, including Senator Murkowski running for re-election. Stay with us. Welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. We're back with two senators, Republican Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Democrat Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who share an unpopular belief here in Washington that both parties can still work together. And in fact, Senator Manchin, you did something very unusual in 2020. You crossed party lines and endorsed Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine uh, for re-election. Uh, I can't help but notice that Senator Murkowski... I'm endorsing my dear friend Lisa Murkowski. Alaska could only be so lucky to have her continue to serve them. Mm. Thank you. She knows I feel that way, too, very strongly. The only thing I've said, it's hypocritical to basically work with a person day in and day out, and then when they're in cycle, you're supposed to be against them because they have an R or a D by their name. If these are good people I've worked with, we have accomplished a lot, why in the world wouldn't I want to work with them and continue to work with them? It doesn't matter whether I'm a Democrat and they're Republican or vice versa. They've been my dear friends, and we get a lot accomplished, and we, I think the country has fared better with us working together than not. Senator there used to be a time when we did that. I know. Stevens and in Inouye, legendary. I'm all for you. Buddy. They would go and campaign in one other states. Oh, Stevens from Alaska yeah. and Inouye from oh, Hawaii. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Would campaign for each other. Yeah. Um, it's a weird time though for partisan politics, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I dare say it's a little weirder for Republicans uh, right now. The RNC uh, just on Friday censured Cheney and Kinzinger, two oh. very conservative members of Congress, because they're participating in the investigation right. um, into January 6th. And in fact, they called. They accused Kinzinger and Cheney of participating in the, quote, persecution of ordinary citizens engaged in legitimate political discourse. Now, you tweeted yesterday that that description is just plain wrong. We cannot allow a false narrative to be created. Um, it must be uncomfortable to be a non-rigidly partisan person during this period. During this part, period, yes. Um, but it can be yeah. uncomfortable. Um, it, it can be uncomfortable when, when you say, I'm, I'm not going to align myself neatly with what the party is saying just because the party is saying. You've got to be comfortable enough in who you are and who you represent and why you're here. I mean, I'm not here to be the representative of the Republican Party. I'm here to be the representative for Alaskan people. And I take that charge very, very seriously. So when there is a conflict, when the, when the party is, 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 is taking an approach or saying things that I think are just absolutely wrong, I think it's my, my responsibility as, as an Alaskan senator speaking out for Alaskans to, to just speak the truth. And I think that that's hard because we seek protection 
yeah. in, our, in our lanes over to the right and over to the left. And that gives you company. But is that really why people sent you here? Is that really what they want? I don't think people in Alaska want that. I don't think people in West Virginia expect all. that. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's harder. It is harder. The easier thing to do is just go along to get along. Or just keep your mouth shut. Just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. But you know what? That's not why we're here. We're here to do some hard things. And sometimes the hard things are to say, I want to get something done yeah. rather than just follow the messaging from our respective parties. Let's I, try I to get something done. I don't think politics was designed to be comfortable, but it sure as heck wasn't designed to be miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? And it's almost turned into a miserable situation because yeah. common sense and just civility, collegi collegiality, all the things that you would think that should go with it and you've heard about and the way it used to work, we're working like the Dickens. We have to work harder now to be together, to work on things together, basically to buck our leadership maybe at times. We've been very fortunate, you know, our leadership, Schumer, he understands what we're trying to do. He's been absolutely positive. He says, well, if you can get something do done, do it. I've gone over and talked to Mitch. Mitch has been supportive of things that we're doing now. So basically, they understand, and I think they all want us to work together. And like I say, it should not be miserable, and I'm not going to be in a miserable situation when I have good friends I can work with. Yeah, but now you're under fire. It's not the same thing, obviously, uh, but it's, you're under fire for not supporting uh, changing the filibuster rules so as to pass the election reform bills. Bernie Sanders has said he supports a primary challenge to you and to Senator Sinema. Schumer has not said that he is endorsing you. We've talked about that and everything, and I told Chuck and I were talking the other day, and I said, Chuck, basically the best thing to say uh, that I would think in a situation like that, but, you know, they're going to support. I, I don't, no, no way, shape, or form will Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer not support their, their caucus. Right. It just doesn't happen. Now, with that being said, I just said, you know, sometimes uh, you tell me, Chuck, uh, Jake, I want to be for you. I can be for you or against you. What helps you the most? Yeah. And Chuck, it might That's be in Chuck's situation. Yeah. He'll say, Joe, I can be for you or against you. What would help the most? Well, With that, you know, you put a little levity to that, but I, I don't put any stock in that. I've had a primary. I've been running since 1982. Yeah. I have never run unopposed. So I'll never. be there for you, Joe. You're going to endorse him? Endorse me? If he's running, I'm, I'm endorsing him. See, there we go. Is um, <laughs> Just a, a quick follow-up on something I asked in the previous segment. Have you talked to President Biden about build back better in any way forward a smaller bill we, we've had a conversation but we really didn't get into that because right now our main concern is to get a budget you want a budget bill first. we have to get a budget bill first the bottom line is the budget bill we just talked to the military we had we had a, a security meeting all of us there and a geopolitical unrest that we have especially with ukraine and and, and uh, russia and with all of europe and all of our nato allies uh, and the military was there and he, they were asked point blank what, what uh, challenges do you have if we stay with the CR continuing resolution? We're working off of basically the last year of uh, the Trump administration's budget. Yeah, one okay. thing I, I want. They need help. They, they want a budget. The uh, President Biden right now is, is trying to decide who he's going to nominate to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and I'm wondering if how important it is, you think, for him to pick somebody that can definitely get bipartisan support. He doesn't necessarily need it, right? Um, but, there, you know, for instance, there's a candidate, a not possible candidate from South Carolina who Lindsey Graham has said very positive things about. It's an opportunity, I would think you would think, for him to put his money where his mouth is in terms of bipartisanship. Exactly so. It goes back to his words at the prayer breakfast. How are we going to, how are we going to unify? What is it that we need to do? Well, one of the signals that he can send is putting forth a nominee for the Supreme Court that will, will gain a level of bipartisan support. And when I say a level, I think it has to be more than just one, because yeah. as, as, as much as that is, it does not necessarily mean that you have that broader support. Not just Susan Collins or you. Some. Well, seriously, there, yeah. there are many, many exceptionally well-qualified yeah. African-American women who could, who could move forward into this position. So Mr. President, I'm asking you to, to look through those critically and not, not pick the one that would be to the furthest left, but to pick that, that one, that individual, who will enjoy some level of bipartisan support. Do you have someone in mind? I think, I think that that sends a signal to the public that maybe, maybe the courts are not as political 
as the legislative and the executive branch. You know, you because know, right now, the country is starting oh, to yeah. believe they're losing faith in their courts. They're looking at them as nothing more than an adjunct of, of partisan, elected yeah. bodies because <clears throat> of the, the, the partisan nature. So demonstrate, demonstrate some bipartisan support. Everybody that's been mentioned so far, Jake, is extremely qualified. Yeah. Either one of any of these of candidates. Of the three major candidates. Yeah, they, they, they could all do a very good job, and they have the, the background and the experience to do it. The thing about I was the governor, so I, I named some judges in my tenure as, as, as governor, and they're very independent. They might philosophically not come exactly where you are on certain issues, but that doesn't really make, make them a less qualified. The bottom line is look for the person that has the, the upbringing and things that basically would make someone a well-rounded candidate. And you look at the makeup of the Supreme Court, and I think that, you know, uh, the, uh, the Justice Childs from uh, South Carolina, yeah, that grassroots support. Basically, That's the one that Lindsey Graham said nice things about. Yeah, they're all, and I, I will predict that the person that uh, the president, whoever he chooses, I think will get a majority of, of votes. It'll get 60 or more. You're somebody for whom uh, diversity is important. Are you the first woman senator in, the, uh, in Alaskan yeah. history? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I noticed that, that uh, you haven't criticized uh, President Biden's idea that he wants to nominate an African-American woman for the position, given the fact that there are has never been one even seriously considered. Um, but some of your colleagues have, have really attacked that point. They have attacked it. Um, you know, I think we need to look at this, look at this critically and, and recognize that you have a, a court that over its history, um, some, I don't know if it's 110, 115 uh, Supreme Court justices, you look at you look at the pictures. Yeah, um, a lot of white male faces. You said it, <laughs> and so how we how we make sure that again our court is representative of the country. Yeah, and and so I I want to make sure that the president nominates an exceptional candidate, an exceptional individual, and I would be honored to be able to support an exceptional. African American woman. I think basically the courts should be, represent makeup of our of our country, yeah. and big, it's time for this. It's time, absolutely time. Big picture, and this is the last question for both of you. Um, what are the forces that are making bipartisanship difficult, and how do we how do we change the incentive structure in this country? Let me let me start with you on that. The things that are making it difficult, I think, are are outside groups mm -hmm. that basically say. It's an either or proposition. If you can't get as much as we want on voting rights, then we're gonna smack it down. If you can't come to, if you can't do it our way with a violence against woman reauthorization, we're gonna key vote it. We're going to, we're gonna make this an either or proposition. And so what happens is you have, you have messages that are wholly partisan that are not able to to get the support that you need, it's okay to recognize that somebody on the other side of the aisle might have a good idea that can be incorporated into what we have done. And it might not be the best idea, but it's a good idea. And if it builds that support, let's allow it. But we, we have this... Sounds these, like common sense, but well, I think... First, uh, first of all, Jake... It's what we tell our kids. I'm not a Washington Democrat. I'm a good old West Virginia Democrat. Yeah who likes all my West Virginia Republicans, and I know that I have to have their input for us to get good outcome for our West Virginia citizens that we represent. We have a lot of friends who aren't stereotype Washington Republicans. Okay, there are Alaska Republicans, and there's all different Republicans who represent the state. Never forget where you came from. Never forget who you work for. Never forget your purpose of being here. And I've always said this, I wanna make sure I take care of my country. I'm an American before I'm anything. I'm an American first. And I'm so proud of my country and the opportunities I've had. I also am here to do a job for the people of West Virginia. So they're my employers. Senator Manchin, Senator Murkowski, thanks so much for being here today. Really interesting conversation. And uh, there are probably a lot of people out there feeling a little bit more hopeful well, about Washington. In Alaska, just go vote for Susan, uh, Lisa. <laughs> Okay. Not Susan, Lisa. Susan in Maine, Lisa <laughs> in Alaska. All right, thanks Thank to both you. of you. I really appreciate thanks, it.